Good morning. I'm Richard Slater on behalf of Lancashire Business View, and this is the Lancashire Health and Wellbeing Conference. I don't think our timing could have been much better for this event as we move into another period of significant change for our workplaces. New strategies for health and wellbeing are being created and tested and refined on an almost daily basis in businesses across the county. Many of the conversations we've had over the past year have been, in one way or another, about keeping our people safe and motivated and connected and valued. It all feeds into the broader picture of health and well-being. It's all connected. Now, it is volatile out there. We know this. We understand the changes that are being made in workplaces to accommodate COVID security. We're aware of the stresses on people working at all levels. But what's heartening is the dedication of so many to making things better. It works on so many levels, but fundamentally, we need healthy workplaces and healthy workers to make healthy businesses. And that's why we're here today, to bring you expertise, ideas and workable strategies to help you with your decisions, to help you form the solutions that work for you, for your business, for your people, for your customers and for your communities, because they're all connected. Lancashire Business View is delighted to bring you the Health and Wellbeing Conference and we're honoured to be supported by some fantastic organisations for this event. Beaver and Struthers, Breathe Therapies, CG Professional, Lancashire Mind, The Landmark, Nugent Sante, Physiofusion, the University of Central Lancashire and Vika UK. Now, our agenda today is designed to cover our four key physical and mental health themes well-being strategies for remote and hybrid working, employee engagement strategies, returning to work strategies, and at work strategies. We'll be discussing this over two panel conversations today. And we also welcome three special guests, Ross McWilliam, a well-being expert with specialisms in the corporate world and in supporting young professionals. We'll also hear from Sally Leach of Henpicked. Sally, based in Lancashire, is a national expert on menopause, which because we don't understand it, is causing around a quarter of our most experienced women in business to consider quitting at the peak of their powers. But to open the Lancashire Health and Wellbeing Conference, I met with Lancashire's Director of Public Health early this week at the Landmark in Burnley. Dr. Sakthi Karananithi has been leading the public health response to COVID for the county and, as part of that, fighting our corner at a national level. Here's what he told me. Sakthi, welcome, Director of Public Health for Lancashire. This has been quite a year for you. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Uh, this year has been such a significant year that it has completely changed the way that we, I think, will view the world going forward. It certainly has brought the need for all sectors, communities, government, private, public, voluntary, faith sectors, all of them to work together to make a difference, which we've got a big job to do in Lancashire going forward. So there is a big team that game there, and what's the best way of ensuring we can get back to work quickly, safely, effectively, and stay there? That's a really, really important question, because work, good quality work, uh, not only gets us the livelihoods going back again, but it's also good for health. And what we've seen in the last year is that how the pandemic has affected the way we work. Largely, it's sent us back to working from home for those who can work from home, but also for those who can't work from home, especially for those that involves direct contact with customers and so on. There's quite a number of changes that we've made to ensure the workplaces are safe. So there's a number of things we could do as we set to come out of this pandemic. Um, and it, it comes with that sense of leadership from the business leaders that A, we can get out of this pandemic and there's no sense of uh, dejection or a, a sense of helplessness because there's quite a number of things we could do. Um, and B, getting the workforce motivated and keeping them at work. So there's a few things immediately we could do as we set to lift a range of restrictions. The first one is getting the vaccine and encouraging our employees to get the vaccine if they are invited to. The second best thing we could do is to be constantly aware 
of the environment we create at workplaces, keeping them COVID safe. There's a number of offers of support available from various agencies, including my team, but also testing and helping people to find the virus because we are at this point in time, very low levels, having very low levels of infection. And this is the time to have the relative advantage over the virus. And this isn't just from team health. This is a partnership that's required across the public, the community and the business community. Am I right? Absolutely right. And this cannot be just an NHS or health driven program of work. It puts the business sector right at the center because what we've seen is it's just not affected the health of our residents it has affected the businesses and the success of the business community is really at the heart of how successful we are going to be in building our health so quite a lot is real partnership working so there's a, a lot being done we're seeing big changes and this event today is, is here to, to consider strategies in physical mental emotional health uh, well-being as employers what issues should we be preparing for that might be meeting us sometime in the near future it's a it's a very critical question that we face as, as a society if you just step back and understand the impact of not having a healthy workforce in our in our business sector the uk last year lost close to 92 billion pounds in the economy just because our workforce isn't healthy enough or absent or, uh, or present but not fully effective. So that's the size of the price here. And that's an approximate 50-50 approximate split between physical and uh, mental well-being. That's issues, right, that that's right. Uh, but it's largely driven by how well people are and how do they feel that they are in control of their work and the environment that it's created by the business community. So with that in mind, over the years as employers, as businesses, as bosses, we've all had to implement uh, uh, on a statutory basis and on a common sense basis, harm prevention strategies. Um, do we need to consider well-being health prevention, uh, ill health prevention strategies alongside our physical strategies? I think it's about time. Um, we need to shift away from just the health and safety executive and ticking the legislative boxes to actually looking at it as a whole, as the well-being of our workforce directly equals the well-being of our organizations, which again determines the wealth creation potential of our business sector. How is that going to shape up? Is it, is it about more conversations? Is, how does it start? I think that we are in a better place now than we've ever been, certainly in Lancashire, where I see quite a lot of business leaders and uh, health leaders and the community leaders really coming together, certainly on the back of the pandemic, to really create that exciting future for us. So it starts with the leadership and the will amongst business leaders, health leaders, community leaders to actually work together in grasping that nettle of well-being of our workforce. That's where we start. And with technology and with quite a lot of advances in our understanding of the well-being, a lot of this is not technical medical programs. Most of this is well-being programs, the way we support employees to think about their diets, their family life, their stresses, how active they are, sleep, how good quality sleep we can ensure we can have with our employees, all of this matters. So we've got, I think there's an interesting couple of layers there. Um, we've had enforced changes in almost all workplaces, whether it's manufacturing or service sector, there have been changes throughout. The way you describe it, we need to manage leadership changes. When we put those two ideas together, what opportunities are there? I guess, yeah, what, what business opportunities? What opportunities are there to us work, workers, as businesses, that have been brought about because of enforced changes? Oh, there's, there's a number of things. You, you start from the point of there's basic sanity factors in terms of legislation and health and safety, COVID safe, all of that. You, you assume it's there. And then you look at this whole well-being economy and the opportunities out there that can never be filled by a state-funded NHS or public-funded uh, economy. So that's where I think the opportunity lies. 
especially around how we use technology and information and how we really create that well-being economy that's also carbon neutral. So connecting our natural assets with the way we live, just going out on that stroll, which we've all done yeah. during the lockdown, and we can hear more birds and, and so on and so forth. So there's a real confluence of how we can create an economy where individuals, organizations, and our natural environment can really live in harmony. And that's where I think the opportunity lies with a bit of technology and help. That's where the big prize is, I guess. Indeed. So let's look, let's consider our county, let's <coughs> consider Lancashire, uh, its business community and its people. And what special considerations do we need? I think the first thing to say that is the way that the pandemic has affected Lancashire and many other parts of the country, but mostly in the northern parts of our country, is that it's not only just highlighted the variation of inequalities between us and parts of our communities and the others, but it's also magnified the impact of the way that the health creation and the wealth creation economies really need to work together. So we need to, I think that's a unique case, having experienced so much challenges during the pandemic. Places like Burnley, so much potential, so much opportunities, but we've also got some of the worst health outcomes in the country, actually. So we need to get the government, see the real links between the economy and health agenda as a cross-governmental priority. That's leadership. That's public service 2.0. That's the starting point. And now then we need to also unleash the power of our communities. If we understand what's actually happened, if you look, observe carefully, there's so much kindness, so much community spirit, so much togetherness, and there is so much that's happened in the last year that we perhaps would not have seen if it wasn't for that adversity and the challenge posed by the pandemic. No, no. And finally, as, as Director of Public Health for the county, what's your ask of the business community? Well, first of all, I really feel very privileged to be part of this conference and, and thanking, you are uh, well. thank you for, for asking me to be part of this. I think there is a, a great reckoning here in the last year that when the health creation and wealth creation agendas meet, sky is the limit. So we must continue to endeavor to have a shared understanding of what makes the difference in Lancashire, both for health and wealth, particularly in generating that new industry as a well-being economy that I think has got a lot of potential in, in Lancashire. Dr. Sathi, Karen Anithi, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Sakthi. Sakthi, it's fair to point out, has become known as just he in our house, as in, he's on the telly, I've paused it for you. Now, um, let's introduce our first panel, where we'll get up close with well-being strategies for remote and hybrid working and engagement strategies. If you have any questions, please send them in the chat box. And in the meantime, please welcome your panellists. Joe Rigby of Beaver and Struthers has more than 25 years experience at director level supporting businesses in managing change from small SMEs to one of the largest companies in the world. Joe is a mental health first aider and a member of the Pro Manchester EDI Committee for Disability, Mental Health and Neurodiversity. Shelley Perry of Breathe Therapies is a multi award winning nurse and social entrepreneur. Following her recovery from an eating disorder, Shelley retrained and later founded Seed Lancashire, a charity for anyone affected by an eating dis disorder. She also founded Breathe Therapies, the not-for-profit arm of SEED, which delivers treatment for mental health, eating disorders, obesity, and well-being. Dave Scholes is the of, founder of Mindsight, a social enterprise dedicated to flipping the focus on mental health in and beyond the workspace. Launched with exquisite timing in February 2020, just a year ago, Mindsight's roast and toast sessions have engaged more than 250 businesses over the past several months. Paul Nugent of Sante Group is a key figure in the private medical insurance and wellbeing sector. He formed Nugent Sante to help make people's lives easier by delivering innovative health and wellness strategies and products. The Sante Group now partners with blue chips insurers and health providers to, del to deliver health and financial protection services. And Professor Sue Smith, is the director of the Centre for SME Development at the University of Central Lancashire. 
Sue's extensive track record of business engagements has most recently led to the development of a set of remote and hybrid working principles researched throughout the pandemic and designed to support productivity and the health and well-being of employees. Good morning to you all. You are more than welcome. Um, can I come to you first, if I may, Joe Rigby? You've put engagement of people, your own people, and the communities around you at the heart of your business plan. Why, how, and what are the results, Joe? Yeah, of course. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so the first thing we did, um, because it was very different for us, we are an office-based uh, firm, uh, so everybody having to go home and work from home was was very different. So the first thing we did was we ran a wellbeing survey, an online wellbeing survey with the staff, um, just to see how people were coping. We did that probably two months or so into uh, the first lockdown. And we looked at the results of that and then we we took the appropriate action. So, you know, we provided any office based equipment that people didn't have um, to enable them to do to do the job as as as, as almost as efficiently uh, as, as, as normal, as a normal office environment. Um, we, we looked at flexible hours because people had childcare responsibilities. And um, so we were more flexible uh, in when people could do the work that needed to be done. Um, we ran quite a few coffee catch ups, either as departments or groups, or even on one to ones. Um, we, we continued with our leadership communications throughout the year, um, all done online. Some are internal communications that we send out. Uh, we, others were actually that our two exec partners addressed the whole firm and um, to talk about, you know, how we were doing as a business, how, how people were doing in general. Um, we organised quizzes, so things that we'd already always done but we'd done you know a pub quiz after work or whatever we we did those but did them online um, so how, how, in terms of so we've, we, we I understand some of the um outcomes of that i wonder whether any interesting outcomes and outcomes didn't you that you didn't expect i, I guess I, I guess what you've got me thinking is just the idea of asking your people did that just that that act of asking make a difference within yeah. the business it did. It did. And it, and it was interesting because, you know, we, you know, your staff, but you don't always know the home environments. So, you know, we didn't know that some people were working on the edge of a bed in a bedroom because there wasn't, you know, the, I, I'm quite lucky because I have a room that is doubles up as an office. Not everybody is in the same situation. And we had to ask the question because we wouldn't just know that. Um, and it, by asking, we could then help those individuals. Uh, the office never closed down. No. We wanted a firm that had to close down. We had to make sure it was COVID safe. And therefore we have throughout the whole situation had a, a handful or so of staff that for whatever reason through the survey couldn't work from home. Um, how, would, we, how would you judge the results of this work, Joe? Sorry? How would you judge the results of this work? Well, well, it was delivery to clients, really. You know, the the massive majority of our staff are, are doing client work, and that work still needed to be done. Um, and that, and that's mainly how we we judged um, how people were working and were they working efficiently. And it's made a difference to your business. It, it has because it's probably forced a situation that we'd all been talking about, i.e., having some kind of flexible working. Uh, policy or practice, uh, which would have been a mixture we were thinking anyway of working from home, working at the client, working in, a, in, in one of our locations. But we perhaps may have continued talking about that for, for quite some while. Um, the whole COVID situation, if there are positives to take from it, which I think we should always look at positives, uh, is that we've proven we can do it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think it's, it's, it's made us all act a lot quicker than perhaps we would have done in developing going forward um, what will be our new working practice policy, really. Thanks, Joe. Sue Smith, Professor Sue Smith, if I can come to you. Um, 
think some things there that I think perhaps will chime with some of the work that you've been doing. I mean, we've, we've discussed there with Joe the idea of different domestic circumstances. And I think some of the work you've been doing is about equality of opportunity. So, so how do we keep equality of opportunity in a workplace when we have these disparate working environments? And how do we keep work inclusive when people are in different places? Sue? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and thanks for the opportunity to answer that. Um, there's much to discuss on that point, and it's going to be increasingly important as we move to whatever the next stage of doing business is. Um, I'd like to answer that question from the perspective of reimagining the workplace. And in the chat, I've just put a set of six um, remote and work and hybrid working principles. And there's a link on there that should provide you with more information to help um, people here support themselves and, and businesses. As you just said, we've been doing research into the impact of COVID on SMEs throughout the whole of COVID since last March, but it is applicable to all size of organisations, including my own staff, um, student community of 38,000, through to the self-employed, you know, one, one person band. Um, and the reason I mentioned the research is that this, these principles are embedded and come from rigorous research. And we all know that SMEs are important to the economy, 99% of businesses are SMEs, that figure increases a little bit for Lancashire SMEs. And particularly to address your question, these, these six um, hybrid principles are all about understanding what, what we've just been speaking about, flexibility, particularly supporting skills and development and training for everybody to address what that means, creating a platform to understand voice, because tensions that would have existed in the workplace, you can't feel and see if you see, you know, you can't see a glancing look or so these tensions will be there and we need to create ways of um, letting employee voice be able to speak about these and not be not let the people who are in work uh, be privileged against the ones who are off site. There's something about being aware of digital presenteeism and transactional management. And then obviously one of the big reasons we're here today is about supporting physical health um, and, and mental health and well-being. So how do we keep, so if we follow, no, a better question. If we were, if we choose not to follow those principles or something, something like those principles, what dangers are we creating on our workplaces, Sue? Yeah, so there's a bigger macro picture of that, about the levelling up agenda. So these are also feeding into government on what we hear about levelling up, at least, of between the North and the South. The North was um, having huge challenges before COVID. So there's something about the responsibility um, businesses have to address uh, and support their, their employees. As we all know, employees, or if you're self-employed, are your greatest asset. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing in COVID in this research is management has been very transactional. So it's been very much, um, we're sort of only really beginning to address mental and physical health and well-being. Productivity has actually increased, but that is largely due to furlough and also employees working harder. So I think the main thing to, to address on this hybrid working is not to privilege one group over the other and that cultural shift to not seeing working remotely or at home as um, you know, lesser, or people are, um, let's face it, not doing work while putting washing on or things. Let's, let's understand the flexibility. Let's understand what our employees need, but also what the business needs. So we need to have frank and honest conversations about the flexibility and the needs of the businesses and also their customers and the supply chain. So really addressing what is expected from those on-site and off-site. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Paul Nugent from the Sante Group, if I can come to you. Now, I don't wish in any way to relegate the human cost or the human suffering here. But as we heard from Dr. Sackley earlier, there's a staggering 80, 90 billion hit to the economy, half of which is through poor, poor well-being. And you, I, I know you're an advocate of structured and strategic engagements, but how far do you feel, Paul, that better engagement and structured engagements can help us claw that dead money back? Well, I don't think we're ever going to be able to claw that money back. We saw the report 2017 where it was 45 billion, so it's doubled, you know. Um, but 
I, I hear from Joe and Sue, and it, it's all along the same theme. And I think employers have got to act now uh, in order to sort of reduce this happening even further and financial input to, to employers, businesses, and the economy. Um, and I think absolutely what, what runs the, the overarching uh, dynamic is communication because, you know, we, we're an employee benefits provider, which has sort of uh, changed over the last couple of years, really, into more of a wellness in the workplace advisor. And typically what's happened previously is employers have just said, here's our employee benefits, get on with it. And, and it's, it's one size fits all. So that can't happen anymore. And, you know, Dr. Sackby uh, touched on it and Joe and Sue, technology is now key. And obviously you don't want to promote uh, employee burnout through digital burnout, but there are a number of platforms out there whereby you can connect with your employees, especially now that they're all at home and listen to them by strategic questionnaires. So what you can do here is, is find out how they're doing. You know, you can, you can devise the questionnaires and look under the bonnet and see what their concerns are, what they're worried about. We did one, uh, luckily, because we practice what we preach here. Um, and Because it's not just about business, it's about what's happening at home as well. So you mentioned, you, sorry, well, about, carry on. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things that came back for us was someone was worried about food security, believe it or not, in the pandemic. But, you know, you can get under the bonnet and, and sort of define your well-being strategy from this. And rather than just saying, oh, we need private medical insurance or we need an EAP, you know, you need to communicate to the staff that you are doing things for their lifestyles to help them thrive at work. Um, and also define a strategy that where you, you know, by being consultative, you can actually apply the benefits that mean to the in good relation to employees' well-being. So, Sue, Sue mentioned earlier that the, the idea of um, keeping an eye on, on your your customers as well, how your customers are changing. And this yeah. has been a bit of an obsession of ours. All customers, all, all businesses have had to change. And as, as suppliers, we need to change to meet their new needs, I think. But I mean, how far has your industry had to adapt in order to, you know, to carry on securing uh, your customers' businesses? Our, our industry has changed from the old sort because we're in financial services. As I say, we the style of business we have now, we, we look after large SME to sort of mid-corporate to, to larger corporate stuff. But, you know, the, the, the smaller SME stuff, really, I mean, there is a, a need there. But I suppose when you've got a global workforce, it's very difficult to manage them. And obviously, there's young people coming through. The world has changed. Technology is taking over. So it's connecting to those people in a different way. So it's not just about, I mean, you know, we, we, we all need the cover and the insurance, but at the end of the day, if you can promote, education is key, especially with mental health, uh, promotes looking for signs for managers, looking how to deal with them, providing them with access to care. And this doesn't have to be, a, you know, a, an expensive insurance solution, but just having helplines and wellbeing champions in the workplace. And staff engagement is, is absolutely key, you know, keeping your employees doing stuff together, albeit it might be online and on an easy to use app. It, it's, it's, Paul, it's quite clear. It's more than just insurance now. And, and by the way, can I just, to our, our audience members, the, the, we will share Sue's um, link to, 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 to her research when we um, send out our post-event email to you. Uh, Shelley Perry, can I come to, come to you, Shelley? Now, how is Breathe you know, adapting to the needs of corporate well-being? I mean, we've got these hybrid models. We've got we've got these new business models. Let's put it that way: home and office working. How do we keep a sense of purpose about ourselves, and how do we, particularly, how do we keep a sense of corporate purpose? Yeah, thank you for that question, Richard. It's a really important question, and to echo some of the things that have been said already, and um, Paul and Sue and Joe, um, communication is really key. Relationships are key. Coming alongside, understanding individuals and the organization and the needs of the organization is absolutely key the culture is so important and um, that but we we don't get culture in an organization unless we look at the individuals within that organization and what their needs are and um, so just to give you a little bit of background about um about breathe therapies and then i could tell you a little bit about um how we've adapted um so it uh, our journey at Breathe Therapies really started from my own story, having mental health and 
mental health issues and an eating disorder, so I had depression, anxiety, so on and so forth, had actually a really positive recovery journey. And I've, my background is that I'm a mental health nurse and I, I wanted to share that really. I wanted to get that out there and offer something that is very accessible to people and something that works, something that is research-based, but is really about preventative health care and well-being. So I'm a, I'm a mental health nurse. I'm a specialist in mental health and mental illness. But actually, all of that stuff starts by looking after yourself um, and looking after each other. It's about relationships. It's about communication. Health how, how, do we, how, how do we do that in a corporate sense? How, how, what's the corporate input to make that sing? Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the corporate input in there is coming alongside an organize, the, the, the organisation, looking at the needs of the people. Because yeah. um, yeah. it's the needs of the people that will develop culture. And the importance of business is culture. Culture is everything in business. But I think what you're suggesting is that, that, that we need to bring that culture from the ground up and that culture needs to be one of share, communicate, engage. Absolutely, yeah. Lo looking at the needs of those people and then addressing the needs of those people, not going, oh, so, so you've, you've had a loss in the family and they're there. Um, feel sorry for you now, crack on and do your work. We can't do that stuff anymore. We, we need to be supporting and coming alongside people. You know, if, we, if we don't want, as, as businesses, if we don't want presenteeism, we don't want absenteeism, what we need is to be real with people and look at what do our people need. Thank you very much. Uh, Dave Scholes from Mindsight. Um, Dave, can you tell us a little bit about the work you do? As, as I mentioned, yours is a relative, a relatively new business. Your business launched just pre-pandemic last year. Tell us about the work that you do. Tell us, and also, can you tell me how the, what the work you're doing now is different from the work you imagined you'd be doing when you launched the business February 2020? Yeah, absolutely. So our, our initial plan was to, to go into... I'm just gonna, can you just come forward? We can't I hear you. Any better? Give that us another better. try, Dave. Is that better? Yes, it is better. Thanks, Good. Dave. No problems. Yeah, so obviously our initial plan was to go into the workspace, into the education space, into the charitable space, which was my background, with effectively support for staff, delivery, you know, workshops, the usual um things that other people were doing in the workspace in our own unique style. And within two weeks, that opportunity went. And, you know, my, my own personal story, I, I'm not an expert in this, you know, I feel a little bit of a fraud on this panel, but from the standard expertise, you know, how that looks, I lost my best mate to suicide 10 years ago and navigated my own journey around that. Some of the so-called experts were brilliant, some of the so-called experts weren't great. But what I realised was more opportunity and more access to different options for me that were right for me personally was really valuable. So, how can you, so those learnings for you, how have you translated those learnings into your business and how can you translate them into our businesses? Absolutely. So within that first two weeks, we had all this noise going around, all these people talking about different aspects of well-being. I thought, do you know what? That's not relevant for me. And if it's not relevant for me, maybe it's not relevant for other people. So that's where Roast and Toast came from. I'd really benefited from having conversations with mates over a beer and over a brew that just went, Dave, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm here for you. And I thought maybe if we bring a few people together, because we're all going through different things, and start to have some of these conversations, maybe that'll help some other people. And, it, and, it, and it, is it not, the, you know, the way you're describing it there, that, that's a measure that I can take without reading a book, just yep. going, are you eight? And, and do you know what, it, this model that we've got is so Lancashire. It is absolutely Lancashire to a T because that's all I've got. I realise that if, if a lad from Burnley could navigate some of this stuff and get some of it right and get some of it horribly wrong, Actually, there's more people like me that don't know where to start, even though they want to help a mate or they want to help themselves. They don't know where all sometimes these brilliant people on these panels are because I had to find them and it, it took some searching. It's a lot easier now. And that's what Roast and Toast was. It was stories of 
real people coming in. So we've had doctors in. We've had a lady from QVC Shopping Channel find it. But they're not coming in as a doctor. They're coming come as you are. That's our tagline. So your story as somebody that's been through something actually is really relevant for somebody else because they resonate and go, actually, do you know what? You've done okay there. Maybe you can help me, even though you're not necessarily the expert. We know where they are. Of course we do. That's really important. That, that's a really important balance of going, where does my support stop? Where do I need to look after myself? Where do we need to signpost this? And that's a massive part of what we do as well. And you've taken me to, a, I've got a really interesting question in from uh, Lee Chambers at Essentialize. I'm going to fire this to you if I can, Sue, but uh, others are welcome to join in. This is Lee's question. As we look to the future wellbeing challenges, is the health and wellbeing sector and its delivery across the county diverse, inclusive and accessible? Sue, that looks like home territory for you, that question. Um, yes and no, I guess. <laughs> I think there's um, a plethora of support available and it's just what we've um, been discussing. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. I think it, that it's more than mental health and well-being and physical mental health and well-being. It's about the whole needs of the business, the workforce and the customers. But the I think the plethora of support is, is exactly that. It's distributed and diverse. And we have opportunities to try and bring that together. So we have things like Boost, the Growth Hub. I think they have a responsibility to try and pull what is available and people like yourselves, Richard, to actually distribute what is available to, to businesses and the point of, of what today is about. So yes, there is support available and some of it's good and some of it is bad, like every single business. Thank you very much. Um, Joe, can I put this one to you? This is some, from Steve Smith of Nuig, which is Northwest Employer Engagement Group. I think that's the correct, correct way of putting it. Uh, so Steve asks this of you, Joe. You took your measures, you did your difficult things, you asked your questions. What's your biggest challenge now in acting on what, what that survey told you? I think it's, funnily enough, it's, it's the staff engagement because one of the big things that, was, that came out of the wellbeing survey we did was the staff missing the camaraderie of working together um, in teams and uh, in an office environment, you know, where there's a bit of banter and, you know, water cooler, chit chat. And that was really, really difficult to do um, working from home. But was the reason we then tried to do the online quizzes. We, we even did an online um, bake off. So staff were encouraged to bake a creation at home, post the photo of. If you're looking for a judge for the next one, I'm in. <laughs> post the photo. And then we asked our staff to vote and we, which links back to us wanting to do something for our communities as well. We asked staff to make a donation to one of our charities to enter the competition. And then obviously anybody else could just make, could just add to that just giving page. So we were trying to get the staff online, get some of that camaraderie going again. And uh, also, you know, trying to help some of our charities that clearly were were struggling uh, through the last year. Thank you, Joe. Can I, I've got another question here, which I, I'd, oh, I've lost it. I lost the question, where's it gone? Oh yes, this is it. This is for, I'm gonna push this one to you, Paul Nugent, if I can. This is a question from Sarah Page. Sarah's the Managing Director of Plums. And she says this, our staff are mainly on site. What ideas to engage, what, what have you got ideas, Paul, that you could bring to bear to improve the health and the well-being for people who are already on site? Well, I suppose it's a difficult one because like we said before, no one size fits all. So I think we've done it ourselves, you know, we've, we've had people doing yoga this morning, but only sort of 25% of the staff. We've tried uh, getting everyone on the online um, local gym sessions and that sort of stuff, but it doesn't fit all. So I think that there are some really good and there's lots of them out there. So, you know, you need to sort of whittle it down, but there's some really good, everyone's got a smartphone. And I suppose with people being on site, depends what they're doing as well, because they might not have access to a computer screen and that sort of stuff. But, you know, we are currently doing a walk to Land's End to John O'Groats, and we've got two teams. Uh, we're, not, we're not actually going in it, but we've got 900 miles to do. We've got two separate teams and 70% of the business are doing it. 
So, I'm, so, I'm sorry, it's not it's not good enough. The Lancashire way would be to start at Land's End and walk all the way to John O'Groats and do everything else on your mobile phone. I'm sorry, Paul, I'm not impressed. What it, what it creates, and this is done by an app, but it, it just it monitors your steps. It monitors your steps. And I know it's a simple thing, but if you've got people on site and they've got a smartphone that's monitoring steps, they log it into a, a simple app, which is dead easy to use. Um, and we've got two teams now fighting it out and two WhatsApp groups for each team who are sort of, you know, planning each other. So... Just simple things like creating some sort of community, really. Just a, a, share, a, share, a shared experience, is that well, it? Absolutely. And you're not going to suit everyone, but I think if yeah. you get it 60% right, then that can be infectious with the rest of the workforce to, to come on. So it's dead difficult to suit everybody, but just simple things like everyone walks, so step counting, that sort of stuff, and then creating a little community within can, can really help. That's fantastic, that Paul. I've got another great question here from this is from Claire Cunningham at Adeco. Um, she's she's asked me to ask it of one person. I'm going to ask it of somebody else actually. So apologies, Joe. Thank you for uh, sorry. Apologies, Claire. Thank you for the question. But I'm going to fire this elsewhere. Um, Shelley, what if anything would you change if you had to do lockdown one again? What would you have done differently given the year of experience? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I'd be I'd be really mindful of culture, um, first of all, and I'd be thinking about how how are my team going to manage this in terms of anxiety, because the impact has been enormous. So a lot of people have been working from some people some of the team have been working from home, and some and some of the team have been in the office, and trying to maintain communication. And support for people I completely underestimated just how anxiety provoking that was for people so really thinking about a strategy around that and strategy around and um, culture and communication and how we're going to look after each other in the middle of that yeah, um, yeah we, we've we've developed a range of workshops that, that, that have come out of that and that's really how we've responded um, no, but so, a, a lot of the stuff that we've adapted for the Breathe Corporate actually has come out of our own experience. So we've been we've been having culture meetings. We've developed culture meetings internally out of that, and because of that, um, we've had EFT groups. That's emotional freedom technique groups for staff. Um, we've um, we've developed. Uh, we've actually um, engaged with a virtual reality company. And developed virtual reality therapy with and through um, this this external company. Oh, we'd um, like to be sharing that with people later. I think they're going to be interested in that. It sounds like a toy and like a toy. It's amazing and it's fantastic for um, for anxiety. Anything to do with anxiety, it's absolutely brilliant for, and people are loving it. It's stuff that you can do remotely as well, um, and there's there's some fun stuff on there, and there's some just um, mindfulness, relaxation stuff, so st staff can can take the head kit or they can just use it on their phone um, and, and just have a bit of a chill out time or they can do something more serious on it. Oh no, I like the, I like the first idea better. Thank you very much. I've got another question I'd like to, um, to share. Maybe you can take this one for me, Dave Scholes. Um, the, the tricky one this, I think. Oh, this is from Jenny Hayes, um, head of people. I can't read the rest of that, I've covered it up. So uh, this is from Jenny Hayes at Naphthans. And how can we ensure that we are reaching those staff who really need well-being support but aren't raising their hand? How do we how do we do that, Dave? I think this is where the creativity comes in. Um, our, our take on this is it, it's not always, and this this will sound very controversial. It's not always the responsibility of the business. It's going back to the relationship bit, the communication bit. You know, it may well be that a Saturday afternoon playing rugby is the thing that somebody needs for their well-being. That's nothing to do with your business. It's nothing that you can encourage as a business or support as a business, but it does come down to knowing that individual. Our model is very much around care and support for the many, not just the few. The HR team don't necessarily know what the activities of your staff are on a Saturday afternoon, but they might be the best thing potentially for that member of staff. So getting that communication right, getting to know your, your staff right. We, we work on this theory that if we can provide some tools for you to look after yourself and some tools to look after the person that sits next to you, 
because you know the football team they support, you know what they do over weekends, you know the relationships, you can throw the well-being conversation in alongside music, alongside sport, alongside what you're doing within your family. Why? Because you've got licence to do it. Because this is, the You're suggesting something that's weaved in rather than something that's too discreet. It's back to this culture thing that Shelley's talking about. If, if we looked at trying to create something where this culture of relationship, where you talk about well-being alongside everything else, positively and negatively, because obviously we, we see well-being as a negative often, sometimes you're doing really, really well. So if you're doing well, you can help somebody else. And the things that you do for yourself beyond the five o'clock when you go home actually could be really useful for other people without it being the responsibility of the workspace. We create great environments in work for people to thrive. We can also create those externally by playing to the strengths of people and the relationships they've got within the business. You know, they, they've got friends elsewhere that might be the best thing for their well-being, not the colleagues at work. We don't want to force it into a hole that, that maybe, you know, don't, don't put a square peg in a round hole if it doesn't fit. Thank you very much. I'm just I'm just reflecting on those. Sorry, my eyes are attracted to the message board at the minute, and it's it's a message that Sue Smith, Professor Sue Smith, dropped in. Uh, I would advise against the tyranny of participation. That's interesting. That so we had a conversation in the office yesterday, and it was, wouldn't it be nice if we all did a six mile walk? And I thought, well, you might think so. And I just wondered, it was that was the point at which I thought, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but we, we, we do need to be cautious about this, don't we, Sue? Uh, yeah, it's just the point that was being made. Not everything is suitable for everyone. And we also have a responsibility for ourselves and trying to create those social, and I don't mean social as in a six mile walk. I mean, those chats that you've just talked about in the football or, um, but allowing that to be okay to discuss uh, during a Zoom or a Teams meeting as well. So I think it's about, just going back to Shelley's point, culture is set from the top, whether we like it or not. So if you if um, we're seeing those behaviours being, embodied from the, the, our senior colleagues and saying it's okay to have the football conversation, for example. Sue, thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I hope you agreed. That's been fascinating. I promised you some insight. I think we've got some insight. I promise you some expertise. We're getting expertise and I promise you some strategies. And I think we're getting strategies as well. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank our fabulous panel? Now, before we move to our next panel, I am delighted to share with you a conversation I heard earlier in the week at the Landmark with Sally Leach, director of Henpicked Menopause in the Workplace. Now, I first met Sally when she spoke at a health conference with us two or three years ago, and she made a lasting impression. Sally's worked with thousands of women, ensuring they have the best journey through the menopause. Prior to requalifying as a women's health coach, Sally held several senior management positions in, in HR and human resources, and she used this expertise to, to create programs to work with organisations in supporting menopause in the workplace. This is our conversation. Sally Leach, welcome to the Lancashire Health and Wellbeing Conference. I wonder, could you just tell us a little about your work in menopause? Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, so my name is Sally Leach and I work for Henpick Menopause in the Workplace and we provide menopause education support across organisations across the UK, really focusing on helping women understand what's going on with their bodies, but also helping organisations to know what can they do to really help and support people in the workplace. How well do you feel menopause is understood as it affects the workplace? Um, I think it's improving massively, but there's still a huge amount of work to go. There are some incredible organisations that really have embraced um, menopause within the culture of their organisation to, to really make sure they're understanding what's going on. But some of the challenges are that even those going through menopause don't always understand what's going on. Um, an example is we did some work with an organisation that were sharing their experiences 12 months on from having done education and work with us. And one of their senior male leaders talked about his experience of coming to one of our colleague sessions 12 months previously. And he said he had um, taken himself to the session as what he described as an ignorant male. So somebody, he said, you know, I knew nothing about menopause. In fact, I really needed to understand both for my own knowledge, for supporting my colleagues, for supporting um, my um, family members and friends. Um, but he said what surprised him most when he went to that session was how many women that were there that were potentially of menopausal age that also didn't know much about menopause 
because we're not always educated and um, taught about what actually goes on in the body and why it's happening and what to expect. In, in that sense, I mean, that's a, a level of understanding there. That, there must be compelling reasons, though, why we should all consider men menopause and think it through. It must be, there must be reasons. Absolutely. Uh, certainly for organisations, we talk about four compelling reasons, and I'll just give you a bit of an overview. So one of them is, is the demographics. We talk about the financial and business reasons. We talk about the social responsibility and the legal reasons. So from a demographics point of view, um, menopause on average happens around the age of 51. And as, as women, we have a, a life expectancy of living to be 83, or one in six, one in seven chance of living to be 100. So actually menopause is coming for many women at kind of halfway point, which is quite surprising. I think there's still a lot of associations of menopause with old age, with getting old, with, um, you know, we ask words around what words you associate with menopause, and these are the types of things that we hear. And you can understand why a woman might not want to put their hand up and say, do you know what, yeah, that's me, certainly in the workplace. I mean, we're talking about people in their, I think it's fair to say, in the peak years of their career here. Very often, yeah, they're often in senior roles, leading teams, really key employees that organisations don't want to lose. And if it's okay, I'd just like to share an example of, of, that really demonstrates this. Um, someone I worked with who was very senior in an engineering company, loved her job. She'd built a really incredible reputation, um, both within her organization, within the industry, managing really complex projects. And the way um, her and her manager had always worked, they'd often catch up over coffee. They'd um, have, you know, those snatch conversations you have in a corridor when you're just sharing bits of information, things you need to action, things you need to do. And that had always worked fine. But what she was finding for menopause is really affecting her cognition, the way she recalled short term information. So she was getting back to her desk and thinking that she was either forgetting something, having to constantly check back. And she said, she said to me, she said, I feel like I'm going to have to leave because I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to damage all that hard work I've done, try and sort my symptoms out and then hopefully join back into the industry, into the organisation. So I've she was ready out. to step out. She was absolutely ready to step out. But potentially she could have left a job she loved. The organisation could have lost someone just because they weren't talking about it. But effectively, the fix you describe is a simple administrative fix based around some good thinking. Absolutely. And sometimes it can be more significant depending on the severity of the symptoms. But, you know, talking about those compelling reasons, that's the demographic reason. But the business case is really clear from that. Just thinking cost of re um, recruitment alone. So replacing someone is estimated to cost, um, cost around about £30,000. But that doesn't explain, you know, the loss of things like the experience, their knowledge, their, the impact on the team they work with, all of those things that can play a big part in it. Um, we see it very much social responsibility. It's things organisation, you know, we want to ensure our employees are well at work. We want to allow them to be successful. And it brings us on to the legal reason as well, that although there isn't, um, to us, it shouldn't be the main reason why we need to understand that legislation. And when you talk about those adjustments, that's something that organisations need to be aware of, that there is a legal responsibility to support and, and look after the well-being of our employees at work. So we've talked about some of the ways we might be able to support uh, women in our workplace um, with menopausal issues. How do we support employers who, as we agree, are a little bit naive? Yeah, and it's really difficult. We speak to many organisations and it's, it's kind of where do we start? What do we do first? Because they recognise that this is something that they should be doing something about. And um, one of the things that we help organisations work through is, is a checklist of how to become what we talk about as menopause friendly. We also um, ask organisations to think about their culture. How do they communicate this? Because it's just having a policy there, as we know with many things in an organisation, it's not just about having the policy. It's how's that embedded? How is this normalised within the organisation? So it's okay to talk about menopause. Somebody doesn't feel they can't talk about menopause because it's never been spoken about. So we do have, so we have some practical support and, and, and how does that, how can we help our business community in Lancashire with that practical support? I think the first thing is, is taking um, some time to really think through those six areas. We have on our, our website a free checklist, which is, allows you to go through a list of questions. And you'll find that actually in many organisations, there are often things in place that could actually really support menopause. One of the big things around managing symptoms is often to do with lifestyle. Is that, is that checklist something we can share with our audience today? Absolutely, yeah. We can ensure we um, share a link for you. Um, with that so it's a free download and it's just a say six key areas with a list of questions that you can just take through and we 
find many organizations use it as their roadmap to be able to say, okay, well, we're already doing these things. How do we make sure we communicate that we're doing those things? And actually, well, okay, we've not really thought about that. What could we be doing here? So it gives that roadmap of not just think, thinking, I'm not sure where to start. And we'll be sharing that with, where is, where's the camera? We'll be sharing that with you later on today. So that will come with, with uh, an information package later. Thank you, Sally. Um, one more thing. Just let me drive this home to our businesses. Do we know what it costs financially to business to lose so many women from our workplaces, either through lack of confidence or for whatever reason it is, at a certain period in their life? Do we know what it costs us? It's difficult to put a financial um, figure on that in total because often the reason why someone is leaving work isn't actually disclosed as menopause. So it can be challenging. But if you imagine for any of the workforces um, that you're here um, representing today, imagine that you lost a quarter of your female workforce aged 40 to 60, what that could potentially do to your organization. Think about what value those employees have within your organization and the impact that can have. And that's a really powerful economic reason why an organization should be taking this seriously. Um, and, and one of the key things, um, going back to that example I gave, is it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be difficult. Sally Leach, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. No, no, seriously, this is something we all need to contribute to. The prospect, the prospect of losing up to a quarter of women at the peak of their powers. We need the strategies to fix that. And in a seamless segue, let's now consider some strategies around returning to work and being at work. Please welcome your panellists. Heather Orst of CG Professional is an employment law specialist and partner. She's an expert in legal health and well-being, as well as an advocate for healthier workplaces. Tommy McElravey of Lancashire Mind has been a charity chief exec for 14 years. He seeks to ensure that the lived experience of poor mental health does not stop people from accessing opportunities to thrive. Claire Rhodes works at the Landmark, a business centre doesn't really do it justice. But she's supporting business development, growth and the smooth running of Burnley's digital and physical workspace. What she really does is make a beautiful and historic building work for modern businesses. Tom Wilcox is from PhysioFusion. Physiotherapy is at the heart of the PhysioFusion offer, but Tom and the team understand the links between physical health and mental well-being. Tom has a particular interest in long COVID and strategies for managing this entirely new condition for individuals and for businesses. Gabriella Hammond is head of human resources at Vika PLC, a manufacturer and one of the county's larger employers. As a manufacturer, of course, Vika had to keep on making through COVID, but with a lot of adaption, a lot of change and a lot of learnings. And so with that in mind, Gabriella, let's start with you. I wonder, Gabriella, can you share with us how you've had to adapt your workplace to keep on manufacturing? Richard, hi everybody. Yeah, it's um, I think as the first panel um, really focused on, it's about flexibility, um, and we had to really. Gabriella, I'm so sorry to interrupt you mid flow. Would you mind awfully just speaking a little louder for us? Sorry, is that better? That's an awful lot better. So <laughs> let, me, let me bring you in again. Um, can you share with us how you have adapted your workplace to keep on manufacturing? Um, yeah, just to just to reiterate what the first panel uh, spoke about, it was about flexibility and really understanding that there isn't a one size fits all. So um, our business, we've got 350 staff, but they range across so many different functions. But 70 percent of them are shop floor manufacturing workers who don't sit in front of a computer and they have to be in work. So it was very much um, working out what their needs were and what everyone's needs were to be able to balance the needs of the business with the people. You say that there isn't a one size fits all and I'm absolutely sure you're right but are there some guiding principles some universal themes that that can help shake up our thinking that you've learned over the last year? I think the biggest thing that we learned is is not to have not to try and initiate a one size fits all so we started off a communication strategy, which was about uh, how we expected people to communicate. Um, and we very quickly realized that that wasn't going to work and we had to flex. Well, how, how exciting is the wrong word? Challenging is probably the wrong word. Perhaps it's a mix of all those things. 
you had to flex. You've had to keep changing over the course of the last few months to meet new circumstances. Mm -hmm. What's that been like for, A, for the, the, the guys and the gals on the shop floor, but the management and director team as well? I, I think... <laughs> In, in some respect, it's, it's been a huge learning curve, but it's been a good one because it's helped us to realize that simply that process of, of asking what we can do and asking the people what they want serves for, for them to understand that we are here to try and support them. We do want to work in partnership with them. Um, yes, for our business, but also to help them. Yeah, thanks. thank you for that, Gabriella. If I can come to you, Claire Rhodes from the Landmark. Now, I wish I could remember who said this to me, but at least the words have stuck with me. They said to me this, you won't be working at your kitchen table forever. And that was an interesting piece of context. Now, you're a, you're a business centre for freelancers, for businesses. How have you adapted? I mean, you've, I mean, you've had to change your workplace. What you've had to do, I guess we can all learn from. What, what can you share about the physical environment of your workplace, Claire? Um, so obviously, yeah, it's been a challenging year for everybody. I've actually been in the building on my own throughout the whole process, adapting constantly through every single change. Um, so we had to become accessible, affordable, and uh, we had to be available. And that was the main thing. We had to be available. And to do that, it was how, how do we do that? And we had to think a lot deeper than just the surface of businesses. Um, so there was physical changes within the building, um, but what it was for us more importantly was if we're selling, we're a home from home environment, it was finding that fine line of being safe, ticking the health and safety boxes, ticking being COVID safe, but also being a, a welcoming space for people as well. So not going over clinical for people. So have you, you, you mentioned this, so is there something about softening the environment so that it has more of a feel of that sort of the, the home comfort environment or, or am i going the wrong way no there? yeah that's right so um the landmark was very new before covid hit and it's co-working space which in a small town is something that a lot of people didn't understand so we were already fighting against trying to get people to understand what hybrid working was, which was we're flexible. Whereas COVID has actually just fast paced that for us. And actually it's been great for us in that sense, but then making it comfortable and making it safe was a very hard balance. Now we already had all the furniture in and made it all homely, but then having to strip that back and go, well now actually it's COVID safe because we're not dealing with just staff. I'm dealing with tenants, members, people of the public so we've got to take everything into consideration here that we don't know who's walking through that door i mean i i came to visit earlier in the week and i, I must have asked you 20 questions before i arrived because we had guests of ours coming come on site <laughs> how how rapidly have you had to learn and, and have, how have you, have you been led in somewhere by i guess people like me or anybody else coming off the premises saying can i ask you this can i ask you that yeah. can i ask the other yeah, so it's been, um, as I said earlier, it's been on, ongoing. It's been really myself throughout this whole time. So relying massively on the government updates and um, creating a really good relationship with the Burnley Council. So we've got a really good relationship with them. Um, so every month we review our risk assessment. Luckily, we were Bureau Veritas approved COVID safe being part of Barclays Eagle Lab. So that gave us a lot to consider. But yes, through people coming in like yourselves and saying, what what's expected of us what what should we expect so that enabled us to kind of go right well this is what we're doing this is what we kindly asked you to do if you're coming into our building because it's it's not just about us it's about everybody and what we expect you to do as well and what you should consider as a company before bringing people on site thank you claire um, i mean i must admit i mean i felt as I and my guests felt very secure. It struck me that the landmark is very much open for business, Claire. Uh, can I come to you, Tommy McElravey, um, from Lancashire Mind? I mean, all our businesses have prevention strategies for ill health or injury. What prevention strategies should we be employing for mental health? Yeah, it's a really important point. It's a total no-brainer, isn't it, that if you're on a construction site or in a factory or in a hospital there's there's loads of preventative measures you don't just rely on somebody going to hospital or getting first aid once something's gone wrong and so what we do with physical health and safety we need to do with psychological health as well so we talk now more about a concept called psychological safety which is 
what is a, a safe environment for someone's mental health and, and how do we create that? And, and, what, and what, can you, what can you share with us on that, Tommy? So there's a range of things. So firstly, if you're thinking about what is psychological safety in your workplace, the best thing to do is to put yourself in the mind of a few different individuals in that space and ask these questions. If I was that person, can I speak up? Can I say if I see something that's wrong? Uh, do I know what I'm doing here? You know, it sounds stupid, but actually, do I know what my job is? Do I know what success looks like? Do I know how long I'm going to be here? Have I got good boundaries in this workplace? Do I know when my work stops and when it starts? Um, and particularly with people working at home, that's become more of an issue. And if we've got time later, I can go into more tips about that as well. And, and we'll, be, we'll be delighted to share any information of yours uh, in our post email event. But yes, we will be meeting after this, after we formally close for what I hope will be rather chaotic and good fun networking. And we'll be able to go into a couple of more of those things at that point. Um, can I just ask you this, um, Tommy, you, you, what I think you described, the way I heard what you said then was empathy. Uh, and that's what I, that's what if it was empathy for those around us and those who visit us. And I, my question is this, can we teach empathy or can we learn empathy? I think we can definitely develop skills in it. And I think when we talk about psychological safety, what people sometimes hear is, oh, it's just about being nice. Or we have to be nice to people. And it's not. In some ways, it's almost the opposite. Because if you're in a workspace and you're worried about upsetting people and not speaking out, you're not safe yourself. So actually, we need to create an environment in which people can be honest about how they're feeling and, and feed that upwards and, and, and share those concerns. So in, in terms of encouraging empathy, well, there are things we can do around that. And as other people have said, you have to lead from the top. So you have to, as a leader, you have to be vulnerable. Uh, without oversharing, you have to say that you're not, you're not on all the time and you can't deal with stuff all the time. Um, yeah, and, and things like email. So if someone's emailing you late at night, don't be emailing them back because you're just oh. encouraging that, that bad behaviour or that, that, that lack of boundaries. And Thank you, Tom. There's one other thing, though, with this, I think that's really important. There's a phrase that you'll recognise if you've ever been on a plane, which is put your own oxygen mask on first. So we hear that every time we get on a plane and that's drummed into us because if you're in that emergency situation, you can't help your kids, you can't help your granny if you haven't helped yourself first. So there's something really important within psychological safety about looking after yourself in order to look after other people as well. I mean, I appreciate that. Heather Orst, if I can come to you, Heather's from CG Professional. Um, Heather... We're in learning to adapt our workplaces as employers, but what do we need to do for the legal health and well-being of our businesses? We're returning to work, some new working environments, new working practices, but we'll have people out there thinking, how do I protect my business? Where do we start? Well, I think it's really important. We've talked a lot about flexibility, and that's something which is great and, and absolutely is something we can engage with and encourage if it suits our work environment and particular job roles and functions. Alongside that then in terms of how we deal with that legally, it's having regard to is this a good time to be reviewing our contracts? Should we be clear in our communications as to whether these are transitional arrangements, if these are temporary arrangements, if we need to trial some things, you know, Gabriella said, we're not necessarily going to get it right first time. We're not going to necessarily have a one size fits all. So let's review and think about how we're going to implement that from a legal perspective and making sure that we're managing expectations because we've got a lot of clients who have said, yes, we've, we've had to allow people to work from home because it is possible, but as the restrictions are easing, we really need to get people back to work and thinking about how how that affects people, their health, their well-being, um, and other practical issues and how we're transitioning that. So I think that's really important. And then really as well, if we are saying, well, actually it's worked great and we're gonna have a lot more people working from home, either part or all of the time, it's making sure that those home workspaces are risk assessed. So ultimately it's not a matter of out of sight, out of mind. If people are working from home and we heard on the, the earlier panel about people working 
working from the end of a bed and um, uh, potentially seating that isn't suitable or uh, working with equipment that isn't up to scratch. If people are doing that for longer periods, we do need to think about their, uh, the sorts of assessment that we would do and reassurance we would have if they're working from home. So a top, a top tip for em on, just on that little micro aspect, what, what would your top tip to employers be, Heather? Top tip to employers would be let's review. This is a really important time to review. Let's make sure that thing are we are up to scratch because we've had a year where we've had to fight fires as employers and oh. businesses have not been able to take a breath. Let's see if we can have that time to take a breath. Things that Tommy mentioned in terms of making sure that people can speak up. We're seeing a big increase in people potentially blowing the whistle, whether it's about concerns about COVID security or other concerns they've got about health and safety, etc. The reality is, have we got a whistleblowing policy in place? Are we training those people at the top? Because this is a whole shift in focus now that people are not used to. So we want people to be role models. We want people to be able to support and react and promote those good cultures. Are we training and supporting those people from, from the top and from the bottom and hopefully all angles? But you know, you're not going to get that and achieve that change in work environment and culture without reviewing that you've got the tools in place to, to facilitate that. Understood. Thank you, Heather. That's helpful. Uh, Tom Wilcox from PhysioFusion. Um, I, I, I trailed you earlier as being uh, the, the, the work that you've done and the looking you've, you've done at um, long COVID. And I think it's the fact that your business sees the links, the very direct links between physical and mental health and workplace success. So those three things seem to come together when we think about long COVID. What can you share with Lancashire businesses about what you've learned? Uh, I think from our point of view, it was kind of trial and error. Um, we had the members of staff that suffered with COVID and long COVID. We've had um, patients that have suffered with COVID and long COVID. Um, as we were trying to help them, we realised that there actually wasn't any help. Um, there's a select few number of hospitals around um, across the country, really, that actually do any help for long COVID but that's usually just based around the severe cases. So it's all consultant driven and it's almost impossible to get in. Whereas we realized and we focused on what it is that people actually need. Um, and because our physios are trained in kind of the respiratory side of things and breathing and heart and the techniques. Um, and a lot of it is linked with, you know, your breathing and your fatigue and fatigue and muscles. So we kind of brought it all together um, and started kind of treating some of our employees and patients just to try and see what we could do and to good effect. Um, so we, we now kind of started looking at what it was doing with businesses. So a recent um, BBC report and Sky report said that there's up to a million people that they think or believe to have long COVID. So long COVID for those that don't really know is anyone that's still suffering symptoms, symptoms 12 weeks after. So that's three months. So you can imagine an employee in the workplace that was off say for a week because they had the flu back in the day. Well, now they might need nine, 10, 11, 12 weeks off because they've still got symptoms. You put that in a workplace and it's a long time off. And it's like I said, people are then either having to be overworked or the performances drop because there isn't enough staff in. And what, what kind of, what you know, you've done some, been through an iterative process here, things have changed as you've gone. What, what have you learned that, you know, have you got a conclusion yet or are you still learning? A conclusion in terms of what? What the best strategy for dealing with people who are managing a long COVID issue? Um, I think obviously from our point of view, and it's worked for us, but obviously every business is different, different sizes, but we were, we're quite an open business and anyone that's got it or even suffering any symptoms, we tell them to come forward. A lot of people don't dare come forward because they almost don't want to acknowledge that they might even have COVID because it means they'll have to isolate for 14 days. And then it's the knock-on effect. Who have they been in touch with? Have they been in touch with other employees? They'll have to isolate. So yeah. it's just making them aware that they should be coming forward with this so that we can obviously help them because it helps the business. And, and again, every business is different. But when we, do, we see surveys sometimes and, and, and you get businesses that come back and say, oh, 76% of staff responded and 80%. And, but I think personally, it should be 100%. I think it's to do with work and it's in work. It should be mandatory that you get a response from your employees about what their needs are and what they want rather than just say, oh, we almost had 80%. Like I, anything less than 100% shouldn't be good enough. 
because at the end of the day, they're your employees, you're paying them to be there. There's no reason why they can't respond and come forward. Thanks very much. I've got a great question here. I've got this is from uh, Sally French, uh, finance and workplace manager at Freshfield. There's a lot of that, and this is, I'll, I'll read her questions, a lot of emphasis on looking after staff and supporting them, rightly so. But what about looking after the owners and the bosses? This is Sally's point, and the pressure and the worries over the last 12 months of owners and bosses. How do we, how do we shine the light onto that group of people? And I wonder, uh, oh, let's look, Tommy McElravey, I wonder if I can give that to you. How do, we sh how do we keep an eye on the bosses and the managers? Yeah, great question. As a CEO, I absolutely I hear that one. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I think there's some self-responsibility within it. So those of us who report to boards, certainly our boards have a role in doing something about that. Uh, myself, I have a peer mentor. So I, I have another CEO from another mind. And we go for walk and talks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, stuff like that can be really useful. If you find someone who's a peer, and they run an organization which is far enough away for them not to be a competitor with us, but near enough for us to be able to go for a, a walk in the beautiful Lancashire countryside or in the greater Manchester countryside where she, she's based. Greater Manchester, I think, greater Lancashire, Tommy. No, to, I, I'm based in Lancashire. She's based in greater Manchester. So we take it in turns to do a walk and talk in the countryside in, in each of those. Um, and finding that outlet of somebody who understands, but you can have that shared. Uh, and if you need to divide the time up, which is what we did to start with. And now our relationship is at a point where we don't necessarily need to do that. But we used to have, you've got an hour and a half, then I've got an hour, an hour and a half. We go through a three hour walk, socially distanced, and we just get all the stuff out that, that's going on for us. That won't work for everyone, but you definitely need to find that outlet and it, preferably with someone who's at that same level as you, but have that give and take with them as well. Now, hold on, Heather, I'm going to come to you, for, if you don't mind. I mean, you're, you're, a, you're a partner in a professional services practice. You face these pressures. And, and, and I just wonder how you manage, you know, in, in light of the question from Sally Fringe, how you as a manager boss manage your headspace? I think it's important to make sure you find time. I think we all, particularly at that owner manager partner level um think we're too important too busy we can't possibly think about ourselves but it's exactly like the point tommy made about making sure you've put your extra mask on first if you're in a good headspace and you've allowed yourself that time to ensure that you, you your health and well-being is protected and in a good place you're in the best possible place to support your team to encourage those good behaviors have those conversations about tips and things that you have done that have been helpful and it's that exact same point about a bit of self-disclosure a bit of vulnerability and not feeling embarrassed to share um oh you know i didn't actually feel that great last week so i've done this this and this and i'm in a, in a much better place this week people feel like they need to be invincible or feel that finding time for this isn't a priority so i think it's about earmarking and protecting some time comes back, I guess, to that, that, that you know, you, you, you're not much used to anybody else if you're not firing on at least enough cylinders. I think it's probably about fair way of putting that. I've got another good question here. This is from, um, they're all good questions. I'm not, I'm sorry to, to all of those. And thank you for all these questions. I'm not gonna be able to get through them all. I'm sorry, but there are, there are these are way better than the ones I wrote. So um, this is, this is in from Tracy Clark from Planet Sunshine or Wellbeing Solutions. And the point is this, it's all well and good when you've got a big business, you know, you've, you've got people around, you've got HR directors and HR managers, you've got these, you've got a first aid, you've got this, that and the other. What about the small businesses, the two, three, four, five people businesses? What are, what are they to do? How, how are they to manage these processes? I wonder, I wonder uh, who'd like to pick that one up for me? Claire, you deal with, with different sizes of businesses. What do you think about this? Um, well, yeah, it's a really good question, actually, and I can probably view that from both sides of the fact that the landmark itself, um, as I stated earlier, I've been the sole person running it through everything, so I'm, I'm every department, I'm about eight managers in one go, um, but I also then see the other side of it as well, so my advice for that would be to do both what Heather and Tommy have said, look after yourself first, take those moments to breathe, do what you need to do, look after yourself, but then look at where you need help, look at what your natural strengths are, 
what are you naturally drawn to to doing and then look at where the gaps are who can help you with that is that something from your local council is that somebody even a friend or an ex-colleague who might be working in a HR department or might be a health and safety, safety officer look around your network group whether it's friends family or in the workplace and then see what advice you can can get because again we've all said it one size doesn't fit all every business every person is going to have to adapt differently through this whole process so you've got to look at what you're doing as a company what do you need to do and how are you going to get from a to b without burning yourself and just get the outsources where you can when you need to Gabrielle, if I can bring that bring, bring that round to you, you're you know you're you're a big business. Um, we've heard their descriptions of you know how you can get this help from friends and family. You can get it from people within your business. You can get it from external sources, from prof- professional sources. How do you view that in a in, in an organisation that has you know international capacity? That how do you view that? Where do we go best for the support, or is it all inbuilt? I think. Um, Gabrielle, sorry. I think. Um, just as we've said, there are so many different bought-in sources that you can find. But I, from my own experience, it's info sharing. So speaking to colleagues from other our other vicas of, of situations that they're finding. But then also coming on forums like this. Yeah. These are this is free advice. This is this is the best outsourcing that you could possibly have. Um, and a number of the things that we've done, we've picked up from different types of forums like this. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's great. That um, Tom, I'm going to give you the last word on this panel, if you don't mind. Tom, I wonder if you can, in your role as a physical health expert and a mental health expert and a well-being expert, what's the best thing we can do to look after ourselves in order we can look after those around us? Um, I think really trying to find out what it is exactly that you need. I mean, our biggest problem sometimes is we do focus on everyone else and um, we try and put someone else's needs first, but I don't think people are selfish enough. So as business professionals, I think you've got to ask yourself, what is it that you actually want? If you were in a working environment, what would you see as a good benefit? Um, and I think obviously you can then filter it through um, and start dealing with people one by one. I mean, we found that one-to-one has always worked better for us. We've sent out group and mass emails. We've sent out surveys. We've sent out this and that. One-to-one, you really find out what, what it is that people want. And it's usually it's physical, mental, or nutritional. They want one of those three. Um, we we do packages for companies where we've done it, where they've, they've offered them a couple of each, um, or say six, second, six sessions, and they can use two or one, two or the other. But if you can find out what it is specifically, um, that people need, then I think you stand yourself in good stead going forward because whether it's physical or mental or nutritional, the benefits are when you're feeling right that it will affect your business. Yeah. So it's, it's that idea, isn't it? It's, it's, I need some me time, then I can give you some you time. Exactly, yeah. Just be a bit more selfish from uh, from the top, really. Be more selfish. And once once they find you know, what it is that, that they want, it'll, it'll soon filter through. Yeah. I think we know exactly it has to start from the top anyway. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I think we might not use the headline, be more selfish, but <laughs> uh, I think we all know what you're saying. Ladies and gentlemen, can, can you do whatever you do? Do what I'm going to do. Rattle your teacups. That was brilliant. Thanks ever so much for another fantastic panel. Uh, and you are all welcome. And please stay around with us later on. Now, last but not least of our guests, uh, I am now, oh, I've lost my quite honor oh, there on there. Now, last but not least of our guests, I am delighted to introduce Ross McWilliam, owner of Mindset Pro. Uh, Ross is a freelance speaker and mindset author with over 30 years experience empowering leaders in business, education, and in sport. During this time, Ross has engaged with more than 500,000 people, children, young adults, and senior professionals. He's based in Preston, but today he joins us from Studio Two, just up the corridor there. Welcome to you, Ross. How are you, sir? I'm good, Richard, but I'm not as good as you. Ah, bless you, sir. And Ross, you work with all kinds of interesting organisations and individuals. Tell us, tell us a few of the things you've learned, and what do you like to share when it comes to health and well-being? Yeah, we you know got some great experts in the rooms today. It's been fascinating listening to it. 
The things I've learned is that people are very much aware of what to do. It's just sometimes getting started and keeping in a good groove. And I think Sue from Plum said, how do I start it off? And, you know, the simple answer to it is have conversations. And within the conversations, make sure you're listening so we can get the engagement and, you know, dare I say it, the fun and enjoyment at work, which ultimately helps the bottom line. So and, everybody wins. And, and is that something that you're able to share with, um, um, with businesses? And is, is that part of the programs you deliver? Is that, you know, if we can have a bit of fun, it might help. Yeah, mental health, you know, we've all got uh, mental health, you know, some is more compromised than others. And I have a, not a lighthearted approach, but I try and balance it up because if we're enjoying life and we're feeling good about things and we're in flow with our personal life or professional life, then things work for us better rather than fighting against that flow. So I try to introduce concepts and ways of thinking and being that easy to assimilate, easy to remember, but crucially, easy to implement. And, and change doesn't happen quickly. You know, change takes time. And you know, we talk about two concepts in change. We talk about an awareness of the need to change. And then we talk about the action. So if we have those two together, over time, we'll get change. You'll read books that will say 21 days for a habit to change. But generally speaking, it does take a bit longer. And if you can enjoy that journey, then it's probably going to be more fun and more productive. Now, we spoke in our last conversation, uh, towards the end of our last conversation, about uh, looking after yourself and to look after others. Ross, your job is to help others, individuals and businesses. But what do you do for your health and well-being? Well, you know, I've listened to some of the panel today and I like the vulnerability. You know, we've all, many of us, not all of us, many of us have had health challenges. And a few years ago, I had a series of panic attacks. And basically, I was juggling too much, being too resilient. And I do talk about the caveat of resilience. We can just do too much for too long. And the body, we've got to listen to the body and the mind. So for me, myself, it's just been a word when I feel a little bit tired or a bit frustrated or a bit ratty and do something about that. And I'm in one of those different cohorts i've got some disability and, and i don't do as much on my own but where you know i'm very isolating where i am but what i do like to do is recognize it that awareness i talk about then simple things and we all know this getting outdoors yeah. nice and peace and quiet for me it's coming away from noise i, I just want to get away from the noise i exercise most days at home i go up and down the stairs if you want to call that running i do a little few weights but it's it's when i get outdoors i come alive and and for me my well-being is where i remove myself from any extraneous noise and that that is the beauty of it for me now that, that's great and, and, and i must admit i share entirely that it's it's quiet that i, that I, I cherish uh, which is bizarre because all I do is make a noise most of the time. Anyway, um, I don't know about you, <laughs> Ross, but I am feeling pretty motivated by this event. What do you got, Ross? What have you got up your sleeve? You do a bit of motivation. What can you send us home with? Over to you, Ross McWilliam. Oh, I love the pressure, Richard. Um, like I said before, change does take time and we can get excited and motivated. Then we can get overwhelmed by it all and stop. And that habit of stop starting can be very demoralizing and demotivating. So how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So get some ideas, try some things out, see what works for you. But we've talked about our lives in isolation. But if you want the most out of life, you've got to be connected. Connected to people, and then that connection can go into collaboration. Now I say that because no man is an island. And when we feel connected, we feel cared for. And when we feel cared for, we feel that we can achieve more than we're actually capable of because people support us, they believe in us, and that empowers us. So if we want to achieve any change, we need to be connected to people and we need them to have collaborations and see the world not as competition, not as comparison, as collaboration. Because I generally believe, and this is my viewpoint only, that people want to help other people. And if I go along with that viewpoint, I engender trust. If I trust people, generally speaking, they trust me back. So if anybody wants to make some changes from this excellent presentation today, take it slowly, join with other people, see what works for you, be brave and throw things away that doesn't work for you. Somebody mentioned about the walking and steps and stuff. It doesn't really work for me that. So throw it away. Find out what works for you. Take it slowly and try, and here's a big word for you, try and enjoy the journey as well as that destination. I think we like that. 
That's lovely, is that, Ross? That's fantastic. Come on. Go slow, connect, collaborate, be brave. Am, am I on the right lines? Yeah, being brave, knowing who you are, your values, your beliefs, and stick to them. You know, I've got to that ripe old age of 60 now where I care so much about people, but first and foremost, how do I feel? Do I feel compromised? Do I feel I want to make a contribution? Do you want to help other people? Yes, yes, and yes. And by being more relaxed with the ease of who you are and what you stand for, I think people gravitate towards you rather than you chasing them. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop it there. The fabulous Ross McWilliam. Thank you, sir. That's been fantastic. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have a brew with Ross in a minute because he is up the other end of the corridor. But as far as we're concerned, this concludes our formal business for the day. But please, please stay with us. In about two minutes' time, we'll be opening up for uh, networking. It will, I hope, be a bit chaotic because that's why it becomes entertaining. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in for your many and varied contributions, particularly everyone who sent me questions. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly thank those whose questions I couldn't use. I'm sorry, they were all great, but with some super questions. Thank you for them all. I'd like to thank our guest speakers, Dr. Saxley Karanunithi, Sally Leach, and Ross McWilliam there. And to our panelists, they've shared insight, they've shared expertise, they've shared practical tips, they've shared strategies, they've shared solutions. And those people who did that were Joe Rigby, Shelley Perry, Heather Aust, Tommy McElravey, Dave Scholes, Tom Wilcox, Paul Nugent, Claire Rhodes, Sue Smith, and Gabriella Hammond. I'd like to thank Lancashire Business Views partners on this event, Beaver and Struthers, Breathe Therapies, CG Professional, Lancashire Mind, The Landmark, Nugent Sante, PhysioFusion, the University of Central Lancashire, and Vika UK. Thanks too to our friends here at Big Tank Productions, Rob's there, Josh is there, for their televisual excellence and expertise. I'd like to thank Holly Martin and Abby Leake for their backstage brilliance back at LBVHQ, to Scott Dawson Advertising, who shot the interviews for us at the landmark. Now, the story of this conference will be reported online by our editor, Jet Henderson, and the whole conference will be available to watch back on demand from this afternoon. I'd like to commend to you the current edition of Lancashire Business View magazine. There's an extended feature in there, nine pages on health and well-being and how it can help. And we, uh, this feature is designed to help you in your businesses. Fundamentally, we hope that today's conversations are just the beginning, that they start many more. Our speakers, our sponsors would welcome those conversations. So please see how they can help your businesses or the businesses of your clients. As I said at the start, everything is connected. Good business, good health, good well-being. So let's stay connected. Let's do what Ross told us to do. Finally, if you can buy it in Lancashire, buy it in Lancashire. And if you can sell it in Lancashire, you can sell it around the world. I've been Richard Slater on behalf of Lancashire Business View, and this has been the Lancashire Health and Wellbeing Conference. Thanks all.